Why do we look the way we look? Most of it's down to dear old planet Earth. It's atmosphere, gravity, that kind of stuff. When you go on a week-long beach getaway, you get a tan. Basic. But what about living on a whole other planet? One astronaut spent a whole year living on the International Space Station. Zero gravity means no healthy pressure on your body, so his bones got weaker. So did his muscles. It also gave him more space between his vertebrae, so he got a bit taller. And that's only a year. The more time you spend at the beach, the darker your tan gets. So, what if we move to Mars? The first major change you might notice after a couple hundred years is your brand new skeleton. Gravity on Mars is much lower than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would probably shrink. Not great for surviving on a new planet. Gravity would make us feel our weight differently. If you weighed 150 pounds on Earth, you'd only feel like you weighed about 50 pounds on Mars. You'd need to eat more to get stronger and bigger to make up for Mars's weak gravity. Sweet! Time to grow some larger and stronger bones, organs, muscles, everything. There'd be one more dramatic change. Your largest organ, your skin. It's the most important barrier that protects you from everything. Germs, wind, UV light, looking totally creepy, you name it, it does it. You might just need a whole new skin. How do you feel about orange? Sorry, people, green skin is totally sci-fi. Here's the deal. Carotenoids offer quite a nice protection against UV light. That's the stuff you find in carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, pumpkins. A Mars farmer's market could make a fortune. The more of these veggies you eat, the more orange your skin's gonna get. If you followed a special diet and wore high-tech gear, chances are, one day, living on Mars might be totally normal. Living on Mercury would be really tough. It's the closest planet to the Sun, and it's definitely hotter than Earth, but weirdly, not hotter than Venus. It's really hot during the day, about 800 degrees, but at night, it drops to negative 290. Days on Mercury are kind of crazy. You know, when you finish the day, but you didn't really get a lot done? Problem solved, move to Mercury. A day on this planet lasts about 58 Earth days. That means you'd have a lot of time to get ready for bed. My guess, though, you'd probably get kind of bored. One excellent solution. Somehow, become made of metal, like titanium, nickel, or platinum. Those guys can handle extreme conditions. Life on Venus would be way worse than Mercury or Mars. Pressure might be a tiny issue. You'd probably have one long, never-ending headache. Standing on Venus is like being 3,000 feet underwater. Oh, and that thing we need every moment of the day? Chocolate. I mean, air? There's not a lot of that floating around on Venus. There's carbon dioxide everywhere, and the planet's surface is completely dry. That means it's going to be hot. 870 degrees hot. There are a few species on Earth that can survive the boiling point of water. And maybe if they mutated somehow, they'd survive Venus's crazy heat. 266 degrees is the record so far, set by a species of microbes. So get ready for an epic body transformation. Want to live on Venus? You'd probably have to turn into a tiny microbe just to survive. Luckily, Venus's atmosphere has phosphine, which isn't great for humans, but microbes just love it. But since you're not a microbe, not yet anyway, you'd need to wear special gear to control the pressure and feed you air. It's not looking good. Maybe it'd be easier on Jupiter. Yeah! No. It's got no solid land. This planet's made of hydrogen and helium and is known as a gas giant. Unlike Saturn, you'd probably end up just floating around on it. It's like a giant cloud, and if you ever managed to land, it'd be like walking through a super thick fog. Temperatures fluctuate a lot here. It's freezing on the surface, and the atmosphere can be super hot below the surface. We don't really even know. If you lived on Jupiter, 
there'd be no spoken languages. The gas planet absorbs radio waves, so even if you could speak, no one would hear you anyway. And there'd be no music, so no dance parties. What's the point? People would have to communicate in sign language. Great, but it's not. The atmosphere on Jupiter is wild. All kinds of winds and gas clouds. You probably wouldn't even be able to see anything. So that's not gonna happen. Still, Jupiter is awesome to look at. It's so big that it can fit all the other planets in our solar system inside it, with room to spare. A trip to Saturn will set you back about a decade, and it'd be a big old waste of time. Saturn's mostly made up of layers of gas. It has no solid surface, so farming, building, or any other normal Earth activities are out of the question. Before landing on Saturn itself, you'd probably want to explore those iconic rings around it. You'd fail, though, because the rings are made of millions of ice sprinkles floating in space. That's pretty hard to walk on. You might have thought that Saturn was going to be a good fit for you. Some layers of this gas giant sphere actually have quite a nice temperature. If you dive into Saturn, you'll get to a layer with liquid molecules and a cool 32 degrees. That's like northern Canada, Alaska, Sweden, except that you can't walk on it. Anyway, it's only one minor layer, and the rest of the planet is insanely cold. So I guess if you still want to live on Saturn, you've got some work to do. No biggie. It just got to turn into a snowball or something. What about Uranus? Time is kind of weird on Uranus. So if you're out that way looking for a nice vacation spot, definitely choose this planet. A two-week getaway on Earth lasts three years on Uranus. There's even a sea if you're up for a beach vacation. The only problem is that it's made of ammonia, that gross-smelling stuff they use for cleaning. But watch out where you land. If you get it wrong, you might end up spending a whole year without any sun. How would you change if you had to spend a whole year in the freezing dark Uranus winter? We'd need bigger eyes to see in the dark, plus more of that thicker skin to keep the cold out. We might even develop a new hearing system, like dolphins have. Neptune. It's another gas planet, but scientists think there's probably a dense core inside. If you took the plunge to live on Neptune, you'd probably turn into a space reptile or cosmic fish endlessly floating around on the surface. Gravity on Neptune is just a little bit stronger than on Earth. Still, it'd be really hard to stay in one place. The wind there is super strong. You'd have to be much heavier to resist it. Time to eat again. Woohoo! But this planet's really impossible to live on. Scientists don't even want to send another spacecraft there. Welcome to Pluto. Freezing cold, tiny, and super far away. Doesn't sound too exciting. It's even smaller than our moon. It would be so hard to stay on the planet. No more trampoline parks, people. You'd probably have to build yourself a huge machine that would spin you around, sort of a fake gravity machine. Still, you try spinning around all day. You'd need a brand new nervous system to avoid feeling queasy all the time. But Pluto's not all bad. There's a liquid water ocean beneath the surface and ice mountains. If you got yourself a highly trained crew and a bunch of expensive gear and regular supplies from Earth, nah, too much hassle. Spaghettification. Wonder if you can choose your own sauce? It's actually something you might experience if you ever tried to live in a black hole. It's the process of squeezing objects, like you, into long, thin cosmic strips. So, good news, you'll get much taller. Bad news, you'll be thinner than a single human hair. You're on a spaceship flying through outer space at a speed of 180,000 miles per second. This is almost the speed of light. Make yourself comfortable, because the voyage is going to be long. It will last a little more than 90 years. It's better to use a cryo capsule to not get bored. In short, you need to fly for almost a century at the speed of light to get to a mysterious exoplanet that scientists have recently discovered. 
They have found many planets in the last few years, but this one can help in the search for extraterrestrial life. The planet looks like a dark blue ball and has a complex technical name consisting of letters and numbers. It's about the size of Neptune and orbiting around a little star of class M, or in simple words, around a red dwarf. The planet is eight times closer to its star than Earth is to the sun. But this doesn't mean that fiery layers of magma cover the surface of this world. The temperature on this exoplanet is pretty low and similar to Earth's. That's because the red dwarf is not as hot as our sun. But the most exciting thing is that the atmosphere of this space object consists of water vapor, or helium, or helium hydrogen. Scientists don't know for sure, so they actively observe it. But if there is water in its atmosphere, then life can exist. It's unlikely we will discover some big creatures, but even microscopic bacteria would be a big sensation. Another reason why scientists keep their eyes on this planet is its origin. If they find out what the planet's atmosphere is made of, they'll understand how such objects can form around red dwarfs. This will be another little brick of understanding of how the universe works. Even if they discover life on this strange planet, it will be impossible to transport it from there for us to study. Fortunately, there's another massive object near Earth where microbes can live, and it's located inside our solar system. In 2020, scientists detected a strange gaseous substance in Venus's atmosphere. These were chemical residues of phosphine. This is a significant finding because phosphine exists on Earth near some microbes. They've recently discovered phosphine in penguins' bodies. Many people started to put out theories that these animals came to us from Venus. But, of course, this is not true. You can also find this substance among swamps and mud. So it was a big surprise when they found residual phosphine parts on another planet. It's weird, since life on Venus's surface most likely cannot exist. The temperature and pressure on the planet are just too high. But high up in the sky of Venus, the conditions are not so terrible. Perhaps some microbes live there. But scientists also know that volcanoes often erupt there. A chemical trace of phosphine may appear as a result of these eruptions. If this is the real reason for the appearance of phosphine, they probably won't find any life. Now they're spending a lot of money on the study of this planet. But let's go back to deep space. Over the past 20 years, scientists have been finding exoplanets far and not too far from us. Some of them orbit around dwarfs and big stars, but some planets exist entirely alone. They don't belong to the orbit of any star. They are abandoned in cold outer space. Another exciting thing is that scientists haven't found a planetary system similar to our solar one. All distant exoplanets are located at different distances from their stars. Their sizes and masses are not like those that our planets have. We call them exoplanets since they're beyond our solar system. Some other fascinating space objects are super-Earths. If some planet weighs from 2 to 10 Earth masses, is 2 times bigger, and gets energy from a star, it's called a super-Earth. No more similarities with our home. Super-Earth can consist of gas, rocks, water, ice, fire, acid, glass, or diamonds. Scientists haven't yet found a super-Earth with ideal conditions for humans. Not because all planets are bad for life, but because our body has evolved and adapted to Earth only. We don't know much about super-Earths. They contain a massive amount of energy because of their enormous masses, and this energy is released. Therefore, frequent volcanic eruptions and earthquakes occur on many of these planets. Thunderstorms happen there almost every day. And by the way, one day there lasts several times longer than our 24-hour one. Let's imagine you're on the spaceship again, traveling to some super-Earth. So here it is, massive, orange, majestic. You put on a spacesuit, get into a space capsule, and you change your mind. The whole planet resembles a fiery boiling ball. If it has any life, it must be some invulnerable creatures. You're not like that, so you fly away to look for another super-Earth. A couple light years away, that giant ball seems to be a friendly place. Wait, this world is located far from its star. The temperature there is so low that even molecules freeze. Antarctica is like a hot desert compared with this super-Earth. 
you continue your voyage and finally find a perfect spot. It's three times heavier and twice bigger in size than Earth. It consists of rocks, gases, and possibly water. You descend to the planet on the transport capsule, open the door, and take one step. Your legs are too heavy. Your whole body has gained weight. You feel as if you were carrying a huge box of bricks on your back. You can't even walk a few feet. And the reason for this is gravity. The greater the weight the Super Earth is, the greater its gravitational force becomes. You are pressed to the ground, and your muscles are too weak for this. Also, increased gravity provokes active fluctuations of tectonic plates. Earthquakes and landslides happen on this planet pretty often. The rocky surface here is constantly changing. To live on such a planet, you would need to develop new technology to build houses. You get back into the capsule and fly away, but not too far. The planet's gravity doesn't allow your ship to rise high into the sky. It's like ropes pulling you down. You use all the remaining fuel to overcome the gravity and go beyond the atmosphere. Another problem with such worlds is meteorites. Gravity attracts not only your ship, but also colossal space objects flying by. A giant asteroid can get off its route because of the attraction of the super Earth. It can hit the planet in the form of a meteor shower, but the falling speed is also faster, so the destruction will be more massive. But the worst thing that can happen to the super Earth is the stoppage of the planet's core caused by high pressure. Hundreds of billions of tons of solid rock can squeeze the heart of this world, and the core should always be in motion to perform its primary function, keeping the magnetic field working. Solar storms and cosmic radiation can create severe problems for all life on the surface. On Earth, these storms disrupt the operation of electronics and affect human health. This happens even if small holes appear in the magnetic field. And what would happen if all the protection disappears? The energy of the closer star and the radiation from distant space would quickly destroy the super Earth and make it impossible for life to develop. All these events can happen to a super Earth with ideal conditions for living. And such a planet is a rarity. Most super Earths have terrible surfaces and atmospheres. There's a planet where the air is so hot that it can evaporate metals. The fiery wind simply splits any solid substance into molecules. Such a super Earth is more like a star, not an ordinary planet. Also, there's another super Earth, wholly covered with water. You won't find a single piece of land there. The ocean floods any island in a second. And underwater, there are volcanoes. They erupt almost every hour, releasing billions of tons of magma. Because of the heavy weight, the planet is slightly tilted. When it rotates around its axis, the water flows from one side to another. This creates huge destructive tsunamis bigger than the size of Everest. And how about a super Earth where it's raining diamonds or sulfuric acid? The surface of another distant world is blown by winds consisting of glass. There's a lot of fire and sand. When the hot air burns the sand particles, they turn into glass. Among all such planets, ours seems to be a paradise. But perhaps for some strange organisms living at the distant end of the galaxy, Earth may seem to be a terrible world. Dark, mysterious, cold space. Comets, asteroids, planets, stars, and something that's lurking over there, far beyond Pluto. Yup, this could be the ninth planet of our solar system, the one people have been wondering about for centuries. IRAs, which stands for the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, collected interesting data back in 1983. It could be proof that Planet 9 is hiding there. No one knows if it really exists, but this discovery helped to build a model to understand this potential planet better. And in 2016, scientists found out that some small space objects in the Kuiper Belt were orbiting a bit oddly. The Kuiper Belt is the outer area of our solar system. It's a ring in the shape of a donut, filled with leftovers from the times when our solar system was forming. You can find this donut beyond Neptune. The objects in that region of space have weird orbits, almost as if a big body with strong gravity is pushing them away. Knock knock, Planet 9 again! The theory says it might be 5 to 10 times the mass of our own planet, and up to 20 times further away than Neptune. The astronomical unit equals the distance between our planet and the Sun. Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units from the Sun. 
but Planet 9, if it exists, is 400 to 800 astronomical units away. It would take 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years for this mysterious planet to make a single circle around the Sun. This makes it harder for us to catch this space body. There's a theory Planet 9 may have formed between the orbits of Jupiter and Neptune, similar to the rest of the gas giants in our solar system. The gravitational force of one of the two huge planets probably kicked it out of its orbit. Oh no! Then Planet 9 could get ejected further away from the eight planets we know about. It ended up as some sort of icy waste, quite small at the beginning. But as time went by, Planet 9 has cleared its orbit of frozen pieces of rock and dust and finally formed into a real planet. Another theory says that this could be a planet another star lost on its way while it was passing near our solar system. In any case, Planet 9 probably doesn't reflect that much sunlight since it's so far away. And astronomers aren't sure where exactly they should look for it. Space is dark, mysterious, endless, obviously. But if we do find Planet 9, it will be the first solid proof there are more planets in our solar system than we thought. Moving on to an interesting exoplanet, located only 90 light years away from us. An exoplanet is generally a planet located outside our solar system. This one has an atmosphere with water clouds. One year there lasts 24 Earth days, and the planet travels around a red dwarf star, which is way dimmer and smaller than our sun. That's why, even though the planet is 8 times closer to its star than we are to our sun, the temperature there is similar to that on our planet. This exoplanet has a size similar to Neptune. It's also less dense, which means it's mostly made of gas, unlike Earth, which is made of rock. The average temperatures there is 140 degrees, which makes it one of the coolest small exoplanets we've ever discovered. And the cooler the exoplanet is, the bigger the chance we'll find clouds in its atmosphere. Researchers have discovered more than 4,000 exoplanets, but all of them have been found within the Milky Way, at least until now. For the first time, astronomers may have spotted a planet outside our galaxy. They called it M51 ULS 1. Hmm. The planet is located in the Whirlpool Galaxy, a distant spiral galaxy 28 million light-years away from us. There was once a huge but pretty young star that got stuck in a gravitational dance with something that could be a dense neutron star, the collapsed core of a giant star, or a black hole. The star's dance partner had incredibly strong gravity. It was feeding on the star, greedily ripping away its plasma. Then something unusual happened. An unknown, maybe even Saturn-sized object passed by and blocked this confrontation from our solar system. Now no one can see what is going on. But this could potentially be the farthest planet we've ever discovered. There's a newly discovered planet outside our solar system. As large as Jupiter, it orbits two stars. And as we can observe it from our planet, it crosses in front of them both. The full circle around these two stars, which means one year, takes approximately 200 Earth days. On the day of the discovery of the previous planet, scientists also found it had an unusual companion. It's an extra-hot Jupiter with an ultra-tight orbit around its star. The year there lasts only 1.9 Earth days. This planet has a weirdly shaped orbit. Also, it travels in the opposite direction from the rotation of its star. If you could travel 57 light years away from our planet, you'd see something pink lurking in the darkness. As you get closer, it becomes bigger and more fascinating. Yup, it's a magenta-colored planet. A few billion miles away from its sun, this guy is one of the youngest planets scientists have discovered. It's only 100 to 200 million years old. It's made of pink gas, similar to our Jupiter. So if you could fly closer to its surface, this gas would envelop you like a thick fog. You're coming closer and going deeper, and the gas is becoming darker, getting a reddish shade. And look at the planet's core. It's super hot. Because of its high temperature of 460 degrees Fahrenheit, this planet is like an oven. The heat is the reason the planet glows so brightly. You'll also notice the sky is hazy pink, with clouds made of droplets of frozen water, similar to ours. There's another exoplanet half as massive as Earth, which is one of the smallest planets we've ever found outside our solar system. It has a diameter of 5,600 miles. For comparison, Earth's diameter is 7,900 miles. The planet in question is mostly made of iron, similar to Mercury. 
Mercury has a massive iron core and a very thin crust, which makes it an oddball in our solar system. At its early stages, it collided with some space body at least once. That collision pulled its outer layers away, which is why only the firm iron core remained. Maybe this exoplanet participated in a huge space crash too. That's what probably took away the planet's mantle and left mostly its iron core. Or maybe this is just a remnant of a gaseous planet that used to be the size of Neptune. The atmosphere of the planet could be blown away by, let's say, a huge amount of radiation coming from the star. This planet is only 31 light years away from us, and the day there is less than 8 Earth hours long. The planet is only a little bit bigger than Mars. People aren't likely to ever settle in that place because of its extreme temperatures that go up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. There might even be molten lava on the side of the planet that faces its star. Such temperatures are high enough to evaporate any atmosphere, so this planet might have had one in the past. Generally, gas giants like Jupiter can't support life because they have extreme weather conditions, temperature, and pressure. And there are no building blocks that might create life. But smaller terrestrial planets, such as, I don't know, Earth, have more key ingredients like oxygen and liquid water. Plus, they have more temperate weather and other conditions. And still, not all of such planets support life, of course. It's not easy to find a planet with similar conditions as the ones we have on Earth, or at least the conditions that would allow life to develop there. But meet Kepler-22b, one of our most promising findings. It's 600 light years away from us, twice bigger than our planet, and with temperatures of about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a so-called super-Earth. It's a category of planets unlike any we have in the solar system. They're more massive than Earth, but still lighter than ice giants such as Uranus or Neptune. Super-Earths can consist of rock, gas, or a mixture of these two. Kepler-22b is within the habitable zone of its parent star, which is less bright than our sun. The planet probably has a rocky core. It may have an ocean, but it doesn't host any life. At least, we don't know about it yet. There are a lot of space objects all around the universe, from stars to planets to satellites, comets, and asteroids. But our closest celestial body is the Moon, which has been subject to much research, theories, and even myths. As our only natural and permanent satellite, the Moon is in the top 10 list of biggest satellites in our solar system. It's located in an outer spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Other planets in our solar system, like Mars or Jupiter, have many other moons. Saturn is the planet that tops this list, with an astonishing 82 moons, of which 53 have names. Shall I go through that list of names? No? Okay, we'll move on. Our moon, with its mean radius of 1,079 miles, isn't the biggest moon in the solar system, but is the largest compared to the size of the planet it orbits. The difference between a satellite, like the moon, and a planet isn't their size, although that might be your first thought. The largest moons in our solar system are really huge. Some of them are even bigger than planets. Jupiter actually has a bunch of these types of satellites, like the icy Ganymede. It's the largest moon in our solar system, larger than Mercury and Pluto. It may even have an underground saltwater ocean that can surpass all the water on Earth's surface. Our moon's diameter is a bit larger than a quarter of that of the Earth. When it comes to mass, though, it's 80 times less than our Earth's. To paint you a better picture, if you think about our planet as being a big, hollow balloon, you would need about 50 moons to fill it. But let's look at our moon's size from a bit of a different perspective. How does it compare to the United States? Well, the US measures 2,800 miles wide horizontally, which means the moon is smaller in diameter. It's difficult for us to see it any other way, but what if our satellite was twice as big? Well, first, we would see way more of those solar eclipses. In present conditions, they can happen two to five times a year, and five times is more of an exception. The last time there were five solar eclipses in a year was back in 1935. You'll have to wait until 2206 to see the next event like this. Hmm, I might be around for that. If the Sun and the Moon look about the same size from down here on Earth, but I guess it won't be a surprise if I tell you the star we're orbiting around is enormous. So if the Sun was hollow, how many moons do you think you'd need to fill it up? Wait, no need to Google. 
you would need 64.3 million Earth moons, or about 1.3 million Earths. Yep, it's that huge. And while we're on the subject of our Sun, it has a diameter of 864,000 miles. Its mass? Well, it's no less than 330,000 times bigger than that of the Earth. What is a star, though? I'm not a scientist here, so I'll try to keep it simple. It's a ball of bright, flaming hot matter held together by gravity. The reason why they give off both heat and light is that, well, they are very hot. Experts call the smallest stars red dwarfs because of their size and color. They are also the most frequent types of stars in our galaxy, with some of them being so tiny and dim they are invisible to people on Earth. It's the case of our nearest neighbor star, Proxima Centauri. Our Sun is considered a medium star since it has an average mass, brightness, and life expectancy. There are also giant stars out there. They are rarer but easier to see. That's why you can safely assume that roughly every star you see after the Sun is set is much larger than the Sun. But enough about it, let's bring it back to the star of today's show, the Moon, our only natural satellite. But is it? That may or may not be the full truth, actually. Back in 1997, a group of scientists stumbled upon an asteroid about 3 miles wide, looking like it was caught in Earth's gravitational grip. It looked like a satellite of our planet. They called it Krunia. It takes this guy about 770 years to make a trip around the Earth. It also seems that it will remain in a suspended state around our planet for at least another 5,000 years. The moon is also kind of steering away from us. With each year, it essentially holds up some of our planet's rotational energy and uses it to launch itself about one and a half inches higher in its own orbit. If the data we have available today is correct, back when it was born, our moon was about 14,000 miles away from us. The distance now is 239,000 miles on average. So what will happen when it moves away completely? Well, no more songs like Moon River, Fly Me to the Moon, How High the Moon, that's for sure. Then there will simply be no tides in our planet's oceans, and our nights would become darker. The seasons would look a lot different, and so will the lengths of our days. Based on current calculations in the science world, this will take about 50 billion years or so. So there's no need to rush out stocking up on flashlights just yet. Unless you just like to hoard stuff. There's also another catch here. Our sun gets about 10% brighter every billion years. I'll spare you the calculations, but to sum up, it's more likely that long before the Earth will be left without its moon, the sun will have already swallowed them both. Gee, I don't find that any more comforting. But hey, what makes a planet, well, a planet? And why isn't our moon considered one? I mean, it's bigger than some other objects in our solar system, which are technically planets. For starters, a planet is a celestial body that does three things. It orbits around a star, not something else. It is massive enough to become roundly shaped because of its own gravity. And lastly, it has the power to snatch up any dust or fragments in its orbit as it continues to move around the Sun. So, we've established that the Moon doesn't orbit the Sun, but it doesn't really orbit the Earth either. Both of them orbit a certain point stationed between them called the barycenter. It's about a thousand miles below the surface of Earth, sure, but still some 3,000 miles from the center of our planet. Since this barycenter lies beneath the surface of Earth, we do not consider the Moon a planet. To be able to do so, the Moon would have to be either about a third larger or a third further away so that the barycenter would be independent of Earth's surface. The Moon does have some other planet-like characteristics, though, which makes it very special in our solar system. Firstly, it has a crust, a mantle, and a core. It also has quite an active geology, with events like our own earthquakes. You guessed it right, they're called moonquakes up there. Hmm. Hey, do they have moon pies up there, too? Nah, come on. Let's continue our space exploration a bit more. Wait, what? You can't hear me? Of course you can't, because space is utterly silent. Since there's no atmosphere in space, sound has no medium or way to travel for you to hear it. 
You will want to steer clear of Venus if you do wish to continue your outer space travels. It's the hottest planet in our solar system. It has an average surface temperature of around 840 degrees Fahrenheit. But You'd think that's because it's closer to the Sun, but it's not the case. You would also think that the closest planet, Mercury, would then be the hottest. Well, since this one has no atmosphere that would help regulate the temperature, it tends to have bigger fluctuations. Your calendar would also be very messed up on Venus, since one day on its surface is about as long as a year on Earth. That's because Venus is rotating slowly around its axis, taking 243 Earth days to complete its own day. If you were to pit stop on Mars, be on the lookout for those blue sunsets. According to NASA specialists, there is some fine dust that makes the blue near the sun's part of the sky much more visible on Mars. Any diamond fans out there, pack your bags, because there's a planet out there made of diamonds, and it's twice the size of Earth. They believe it's mostly covered in graphite and diamond. A spacesuit costs about $12 million, but a visit there would cover the expenses altogether, don't you think? And if you're not a fan of space explorations and prefer the comfort of our planet, here's some good news for you. We have more trees right here on Earth than there are stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. We know there are about 3 trillion trees here on planet Earth and between 100 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. Hey, ready to test your knowledge? Of course you are! You'll get one point for each correct answer. So, without further ado... The sun is yellow. Do you think this is a myth? Ask someone to draw a picture of the sun, and chances are you'll get a yellow or orange circle in the sky. Surprise! The sun is not really yellow. If you see it somewhere outside the Earth's atmosphere, it'll look white. How come? According to NASA, the sun's temperature is the reason why it's white. The sun consists of all colors mixed together, so it appears to our eyes as white. Then why do you think we see it as yellow or orange from Earth? Colored wavelengths, which are yellow and orange, are longer, and they are the only ones that make it to our eyes. The other short wavelength colors sprawl in the atmosphere, and the sky looks blue to us during the day for the same reason. Meteorites are hot as fire when they land on Earth. What do you think, myth or fact? When people see a fireball around a meteorite, they think it's super hot. Well, this is a myth. Meteorites don't immediately land on Earth. Most of them have been in space for billions of years. Space has a cold environment, just a few degrees above absolute zero cold, you know. But don't meteorites fall into the Earth in flames? How come? The fireball is actually the air in front of the meteorite. It is compressed by the super high speed of the meteorite. The outside catches fire, but that layer is burned off on impact as a result of landing on Earth. As you would probably guess, when they land, the meteorites are lukewarm at most, but not as hot as lava. One side of the moon is permanently in the dark. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a myth. Oh, come on. First the sun and now the moon. Am I living a lie? <laughs> so, people look at the sky and see only the bright side of the moon. The reality is the Earth shines equally on all sides of the moon as it rotates and orbits the Earth. Half of the moon is in shadow, and half gets sunshine similar to Earth. That's not true. Similar to Earth, it doesn't have a permanent dark side. The logic is simple. The moon orbits Earth, but it also rotates on its own axis. When you think about it, we're always looking at the same side of the moon. Black holes take in everything that comes their way. What is it? Myth or fact? Black holes don't have infinite mass and gravitational force. But still, no one really knows for sure what happens to the things pulled into them. Experts do know black holes do not have supergravity, though. Let's imagine this. If there was a black hole as big as the sun, it wouldn't immediately eat the whole planet. Imagine black holes as vacuum cleaners. It does draw in a cloud of dust near its range, but other specks of dust remain where they are. So even if there was a black hole replacing the sun, all the planets would continue to orbit similarly. They wouldn't go into the black hole. 
if a star or something else got into the range of the black hole, only then would its gravity affect the star. When you call someone, the signal bounces off a satellite. Is this a myth or a fact? Yep, it's a myth. Or rather, an urban legend or misconception, you name it. I mean, there are some satellite phones, but we, you know, regular people, don't use those every day. Although, your mobile phone works in a much different way. When you call someone, the nearest tower connects you to the other person online. This is why there are tower connections, huge networks of tower-to-tower connections, and hidden cables. The moon has no gravity. Any guesses? Myth or fact? This is an urban legend. Ask any astronaut you know. If you don't know any, just trust me. There is footage proving that the moon has gravity. When I say the moon has gravity, don't think it's similar to the gravity on Earth that makes the apple fall. The moon's gravity is only about one-sixth of Earth's. How does it feel to walk on the surface of the moon? The second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, mentioned it's like moving in slow motion and, quote, perhaps not too far from a trampoline, but without the springiness and instability, end quote. The sunset on Mars appears blue. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a fact! Magnificent sunsets. The sky is filled with different shades of yellow. Now, imagine this in blue. According to NASA, sunsets on Mars would look bluish, watching them with bare eyes. It's because of dust. Dust particles closer to the sun appear in blue tones. There is something called moonquakes. Does it sound like a myth or a fact? It's a fact. Quakes happen on the moon too, and they're called moonquakes. They have different features, not really similar to the quakes on Earth, though. A planet can be hot enough to vaporize rocks. Any guesses? Is this a myth or a fact? This is a fact. The temperature in this universe is indeed very hot. There's a planet, the temperature of which is enough to melt and even vaporize rocks. It's two times bigger than the Earth. This super-Earth is similar to our planet, but it is way too hot. Experts believe that it possibly has oceans of lava and clouds that rain molten rock. One million Earths can fit inside the sun. Do you think this is a myth or a fact? This is a fact. Although the sun is one of more than 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, which is at the heart of our solar system, it can fit one million Earths. Yeah, it looks small when we see it from here. But it's only because it's so far away from Earth. All comets have tails. Myth or fact? It's true. Some comets simply don't show their tails. They look like someone threw a snowball into space. Space is completely silent. What do you say? Shh, I knew it was too easy. This is a fact. Space doesn't have an atmosphere, so there's no way to hear any sound there. Mercury is the hottest planet. Myth or fact? Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, so this should be a fact, huh? No, not really. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system and the second planet from the Sun. But the distance from the Sun isn't what defines the temperature. The heat depends on the atmosphere. So Venus's atmosphere consists mostly of carbon dioxide and some nitrogen. This combination makes the atmosphere very thick. When I say thick, I mean it. Throughout the year, the surface of Venus maintains a temperature of around 860 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's surface resembles the temperature of a desert, but is much higher in terms of temperature variations. Venus spins clockwise. What do you say? This is a fact. Venus spins in the opposite direction compared to many other planets. The Sun rises in the west, and its rotation is very slow. Venus needs 225 Earth days to complete its spinning around the Sun. The planet's distance from the Sun affects the duration of one rotation. It's too close to the Sun, and the Sun has a strong, noticeable pull on the planets. Footprints on the Moon can stay there for millions of years. Do you think this is a fact or a myth? Fact checked! The Moon has no atmosphere. So there's no wind blowing, and without the wind, there's no way to erase the footprints without any intervention. So, how many points did you get? Let me know in the comments. Picture this! 
you've won a membership to a space gym. You get to travel around the solar system and work out. But gravity changes on different space bodies. So let's find out if you can get stronger elsewhere or if you should keep practicing on Earth. Your spaceship is approaching dwarf planet Pluto. It's getting chillier by the second. No wonder! The sun is over 3.7 billion miles away. You must be glad you brought your thermal spacesuit along, right? To leave the spacecraft, Earthlings would need the help of a gravity machine, since gravity on Pluto is a mere one-fifteenth of that on Earth. Gravity is the force that pulls you toward the ground. The smaller the mass of a space body is, the weaker its gravity. So, on Pluto, you can't do any sports that involve running. If you did, you'd most likely fly away. You can try out elephant lifting, though. After all, you can't do it back on Earth. On Pluto, picking up an elephant weighing 2,000 pounds feels like lifting 120 pounds. The next stop is Neptune. It's over 30 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. The atmosphere there is dark and cold. You might get overwhelmed by the planet's gigantic size. It's called an ice giant for a reason. Maybe today you'll feel like doing some winter sports? To say Neptune exists in perpetual winter is an understatement. The average temperature on this planet is around minus 373 degrees Fahrenheit. But gravity here is only 10% stronger than that on Earth, so you don't feel much difference. This world doesn't have a solid surface, so you won't be able to leave the spacecraft. Is that an ice hockey rink I see? Grab your ice skates and your stick and get ready to outplay your fellow passengers. How about a quick pit stop on Uranus? This is another ice giant, and gravity here is 90% of that on Earth. You can do a few push-ups inside the spacecraft, as you won't be stepping outside. The slushy surface of the planet is made up of water, methane, and ammonia in its liquid form. There's no solid ground to walk on. But if you somehow found a way to go outside, you'd feel lighter than on Earth. If you weighed 100 pounds back home, it would be 90 pounds here. Can we call this a Uranian diet? When approaching Saturn, please mind its rings, which aren't actually rings. They consist of pieces of asteroids and meteors flying around the planet. Saturn's mass is so big that it attracts many other space bodies to its orbit. And right now, you're one of them! Time to get creative with your workout. You've scheduled a skydiving experience here. If you freefall in Saturn's atmosphere, you'll reach the speed of 30 miles per second. Don't forget to open your parachute. Eh, on second thought, though, you won't be able to touch the ground anyway. Saturn's surface is pure gas. Quick fun fact, once Saturn got in the way of the 10th planet forming in the solar system, the planet's debris, which partially makes up Saturn's rings now, could have blended into a planet. But it was pulled into Saturn's orbit instead. You're nearing Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. Gravity here is so weak, you feel weightless. Let's say there's a rock climbing wall there. How about you give it a try? Usually, this sport requires a lot of physical strength. But here, you'll only have to carry 13% of your weight. Your climb to the top will be easy-peasy in these conditions. Entering Jupiter's atmosphere will feel like being inside a cloud. See that red spot in the bottom left corner? That's a storm twice the size of Earth that's been raging for hundreds of years. To have some fun here, why don't you do some jumping jacks? I'll count to 100. Ready, set, go! Gravity here is super strong. It's two and a half times as powerful as gravity on Earth. So you'll probably get exhausted at the count of 30. <laughs> Too bad. Uh-oh! Passengers aboard the spacecraft, fasten your seatbelts. You might experience some heavy turbulence. To travel from Jupiter to Mars, you'll have to move through an asteroid belt. Just in case you're worried your ship will bump into something, relax, there's a distance of 300,000 miles between asteroids. Let's stop at Ceres, the only dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. Gravity here will make you feel pretty strong. How about practicing some caber tossing? Cabers are heavy logs that can measure up to 20 feet long. The goal is to throw them as far as possible. Here, a 180-pound pole feels as if it weighs 5 pounds, which is, basically, the weight of a melon. Ready for the series caper competition? Woohoo! Finally, Mars. 
Remember all those handstands you've always wanted to try? Well, here's the place to do them. Mars's gravity is about two and a half times weaker than that on Earth, which means you'll probably be able to lift your own body weight without any difficulty. Since people keep trying to terraform Mars, opening a gym here doesn't sound like a bad idea, does it? Passengers and crew members were now beginning our descent to Phobos. It's one of Mars's moons. Gravity here is incredibly weak. If you've always dreamed of having superhuman strength, this is the place for you. You can work out here by, say, doing some artistic gymnastics. Start off with a cartwheel, then move on to tricks performed in the air. On Phobos, you can start doing triple back handsprings in no time. Ah, look! Earth is about to appear on the horizon. It sure looks majestic from here. But we won't stop there now. Instead, let's visit Earth's sister, Venus. It has almost the same mass as Earth, which means these planets have similar gravities. Now, Earthlings can't survive on Venus's surface because of the large amount of ammonia in its atmosphere. But let's imagine you could practice some outdoor sports there. Do you feel like trying bumper bubble soccer? That's when you dress yourself in a giant bubble ball vest and keep bumping into other players. People play this game on Earth. On Venus, with its slightly weaker gravity, it might be a little bit easier. But still, you have to consider you'll be wearing a 25-pound ball as a vest, kind of like a hamster back on Earth. Not to mention your outfit will restrict your arms and legs. It's a challenge, but it sounds fun to me. Moving on, if you land on the sunny side of Mercury, you'll experience scalding hot temperatures of 800 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're feeling tired after your space workout, a relaxing, steamy sauna will be just the thing. You'll feel like a brand new person by the time you arrive on the next planet. We'll fly as close to the sun as we can so that you can have a taste of its gravity. The sun's mass is huge. It's over 333,000 times the mass of Earth. And gravity here is extremely powerful. You'd have trouble lifting something as light as a bottle of water if you managed to step on the surface of the sun. Too hot, you say? Well, I imagine it's a whole lot cooler if you come back at night. <laughs> Just kidding! On our way back home, we'll stop by the moon. I mean, our Earth's natural satellite. Walking on the surface of the moon will feel like jumping. You'll be able to jump as far as 33 feet. So why not try some parkour? If you play basketball, scoring a point will be very difficult. But then you can jump higher than the hoop and do an epic slam dunk. And how about baseball? If you throw the ball upward, you'll probably never see it again. Finally, we land on Earth. Sorry to disappoint you, but you're not coming back with any superhuman strength. Even when you were lifting an elephant, gravity was helping you out a lot. It was a good trip, though, don't you think? Scientists keep finding new planets they call super-Earths. It's a class of more massive planets than Earth, but way lighter than ice giants such as Uranus and Neptune. Super-Earths can be made of rock, gas, or a combination of these two. They are often twice or even up to 10 times bigger than the Earth. They're interesting to study, but kind of too far away from us. They're pretty common outside of our solar system, together with other interesting planets like mini Neptunes. Those can also be gas dwarfs, ice giants, or huge rocky bodies. But again, we don't have anything like that. But something we do have that those other solar systems don't? Jupiter. It's the biggest and heaviest object that orbits our sun. This king of planets possesses a powerful force to dominate our solar system. Jupiter is notorious for eating planets. A protoplanet slammed into it about 4.5 billion years ago, when Jupiter was still a young planet in its early stages. This protoplanet was 10 times heavier than Earth and was made of ice and rock. The collision was huge. Jupiter's core broke apart, and helium and hydrogen mixed with denser materials. Through time, the heavy materials settled back into the dense core, which is what we see today. And if it swallowed a planet before, it might keep doing it as well. We suspect our solar system used to have many more large planets than it has now. For example, it's kind of empty around Mercury today. Similar areas around many other central stars are definitely more packed with intermediate mass planets with the size between Earth and Neptune. Our solar system was a chaotic place at its beginnings. 
young stars were surrounded by swirling disks of dust and gas. And planets would form out of that debris, something like trees when they're springing up from the ground. Small rocky planets would form in the strong heat and light close to stars, while gas giants would form farther out, where temperatures were lower, which means they could preserve more gassy materials. And even though planets in our solar system seem pretty stable and peaceful today, following their orbit, they weren't that calm before. Some planets didn't have a circular orbit. They had oblong, more eccentric paths. It took them swinging first toward their stars and then farther away. It was like they had been thrown off kilter by the gravity of other planets on their way. There's something called the Grand Tack Theory. It explains things happening in the first few million years when our solar system was forming. At some point, Jupiter, one of the key players here, may have been pulled in closer by our central star. After that, it went back and took a huge cloud of debris. It was like a sailboat when it tacks around a buoy. This kind of messed with planets that were in the process of formation. After Saturn was fully formed, our close neighbors in the solar system cleared out a little. But if the idea about Grand Tack is correct, Jupiter had grabbed everything in its way, and its migrations had caused more collisions in this area. Jupiter might have delivered some of the water that now fills the oceans we have on our planet. It shepherds plenty of asteroids. From time to time, it sends some whizzing into interstellar space or amongst the planets in our solar system. It may have even taken part in the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago. When the huge space rock hit the Earth, it left a crater off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It all caused earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis that made a huge impact on all animal and plant life on Earth. No one knows where it came from. We're not even sure if it was an asteroid or a comet. One theory says it may have been a comet that came from the Oort cloud, which is made of icy debris and is located somewhere at the edge of our solar system. It could have been bumped off course by Jupiter and its powerful gravitational force. This way, our solar system was like a pinball machine, where Jupiter, the biggest planet, kicks incoming comets into orbits that send them closer to the Sun. When these comets are near the Sun, they can go through strong tidal forces that break them apart and eventually create shrapnel-like pieces of a comet. That event was a point when our mammalian ancestors started to rule. That means without Jupiter, there might not be us either, nor the Earth. It seemed like our biggest planet came swinging in, destroyed older planets, and cleared the way for smaller worlds like ours. Jupiter may have been the reason why we can't find Planet 9 right now. Scientists believe it exists, and they think it could be hiding somewhere beyond Neptune, but not Pluto. There are three zones in our solar system, the inner planets, outer planets, and whatever there is beyond. The mysterious planet could be the size of the Earth or Mars, it swirled among the gas giants before they eventually swept it toward the outer parts of our solar system, or even somewhere into deep space. Jupiter has stripes because of differences in temperature, atmospheric gas, and chemical composition. Scientists used to think the only reason for these different colors was the mighty atmospheric wind and materials circulating between layers of the atmosphere. Now we know the light-colored stripes, or so-called zones, show us where the gas rises. When the stripes are dark-colored, they're called belts and can tell us where gas is sinking. Jupiter's moons could also be why the planet is stripy, because they're tugging on its atmospheric convection cells. At the center of Jupiter, there's a dense liquid core made of helium and metallic hydrogen, together with dissolved heavier elements. As we go further from its center, the temperature and pressure inside the planet drop off. That way, the liquid interior gives way to gases from the atmosphere. Again, mostly helium and hydrogen. No one knows how deep this liquid gas boundary lies, but the planet is probably fully liquid a couple of thousand miles under its cloud tops. Jupiter would still be bigger than some other giants, like Saturn, if we could strip its gases. Jupiter is sometimes even called a failed star, although that's not quite correct. It's mostly made of hydrogen, like regular stars, but it's still not massive enough to start thermonuclear reactions in its core, which would eventually turn it into a real star. In theory, every object could be turned into a star if you only add enough matter to it. If there's enough mass, 
the temperature and internal pressure will increase and start thermonuclear reactions. So, to turn Jupiter into a star, such as the Sun, you'd have to make it 1,000 times more massive. But to form a cooler red dwarf, you'd only need 80 Jupiter masses more. That way, Jupiter won't spontaneously become a new star of our solar system. But if many space objects with similar mass collide with it, or in other words, if Jupiter eats them, then maybe. <laughs> you never know. But in theory, if it could become a massive star, it would have stopped other planets from forming in stable orbits. It would have also increased the radiation that the surface of those planets get, which is why it would be really hard for life to develop in our solar system. Jupiter is the planet that spins the fastest in our solar system. It only needs 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis, even though it's huge, more than 300 times bigger than the Earth, and 2.5 times more massive than the rest of the planets in our entire solar system together. But if it got more massive, it would shrink. More mass would make Jupiter denser, which means it would begin pulling in on itself. So it could get four times its mass and would still be the same size. We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20th, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19th, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the Earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 60-40 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The Red Planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. 
Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions, and it will most likely have spider legs to move since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. Designing a vehicle is challenging considering the many external factors and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now, I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. 
the vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they? There are many different conditions on other planets and moons that could affect how your pet would evolve there. Take gravity, for example. On a bigger or denser planet, gravity would be higher, meaning that life would evolve to be shorter, sturdier, and perhaps with multiple limbs for structural support. On a lighter planet with weaker gravity, life could hop, soar, and glide more easily, and would be more likely to evolve a lighter, taller build. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun, a dusty, cold, desert world. Mars is also a dynamic planet with seasons, polar ice caps, canyons, extinct volcanoes, and evidence that it was even more active in the past. Gravity on Mars is lower than on Earth, and it's farther from the Sun, so we would see less sunlight. Mars also has no protective magnetic field due to its thin atmosphere, exposing everything to radiation. Sometimes, strong winds create dust storms that howl around the whole planet, and the dust continues to settle for months after. Your pet dog on Mars would probably have a taller, robust build to compensate for poor gravity, and would have bigger eyes to better perceive the far-off sun. To protect itself from radiation, your dog would have to switch its pigmentation from melanin to carotenoids, which give carrots, tomatoes, and oranges their color. So the dog would probably have orange skin. Since Mars has weak gravity, your cat would probably be lighter and would jump more to get around the place. It would also have longer legs. Jupiter is called a gas giant. The planet is covered in thick red, brown, yellow, and white clouds. The clouds make the planet look like it has stripes. Living on the surface of Jupiter might prove to be challenging. Since there's no actual surface, the planet consists entirely of gas. But it doesn't mean it's just a giant cloud hanging in space. If you venture through its atmosphere to deeper parts, the gas becomes denser until it turns into liquid. So one layer of Jupiter is an ocean made of hydrogen instead of water. With high pressure, extreme temperatures, and a fluid environment, we'll have to draw some inspiration from deep water dwellers who deal with the same conditions but on a smaller scale. Your cats and dogs would be big isopods with shells to protect them from Jupiter's radiation. Like its fellow gaseous neighbor Jupiter, Saturn is a gargantuan cloud of hydrogen and helium with no solid land and powerful winds. Like Jupiter, it gets tighter within, but its core is much smaller. Its iconic rings are made of a myriad of ice particles, so nothing could live on them, unfortunately. Saturn's volume is greater than 760 Earths, and it's the second most massive planet in the solar system, about 95 times Earth's mass. Saturn's average density is less than water, so this behemoth of a planet could float in a bathtub if there were one of a suitable size. The only way to move within Saturn's thick fog is by flopping around like a jellyfish. Your dog would probably have an umbrella-shaped bell to propel itself up, and no skeleton, so that it wouldn't be crushed by the pressure. Your cat would have jellyfish tentacles to move around. Life is tough on Mercury. This tiny planet is closest to the sun, so the sunlight here is seven times more powerful than on Earth. No sunscreen would be able to manage that. Mercury is about two-fifths the size of Earth, with a similar gravity to Mars, or about 38% of Earth's gravity. This means that you could jump three times as high on Mercury, and heavy objects would be easier to pick up. Mercury's temperature is extreme, swinging between a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit at night. It's all accompanied by constant meteor showers and quakes. As a bonus, there is a very thin atmosphere and no air to breathe. Flesh and bone could never handle these severe conditions. So instead, your pets here would be made of something similar to refractory metal, like titanium. There'd be no need for a respiratory system, so their pretty metal faces would be without a nose. And their eyes would probably look like thick sunglasses to protect them from all this sun exposure. If there's anywhere harder to live than on Mercury, it's Venus. Venus is the second planet from the sun and is Earth's closest neighbor in the solar system. 
Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon, and sometimes looks like a bright star in the morning or evening sky. The temperature here is a whopping 880 degrees Fahrenheit, and the atmosphere is so thick, it creates a greenhouse effect. The surface is dry and full of surprises like volcanic eruptions, hurricane winds, and lightning. And as a cherry on top, the pressure here feels like you're one mile underwater, giving you a never-ending headache. It would be hard to imagine your pet living on Venus. The only things that could possibly survive there are anaerobic bacteria. Venus eats away at everything, even metal, making quick work of any human spacecraft. And Venus's atmosphere contains phosphine, which is toxic for anything that breathes oxygen, but means life for microbes. Icy, dark, and plagued by strong winds, Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of cold liquids, methane, water, and ammonia. Methane makes Uranus blue, and it has faint rings, while Neptune is dark, cold, and very windy, as it's the last of the planets in our solar system. It's more than 30 times as far from the sun as Earth is. Neither of them has a solid surface, and their atmospheres slowly merge into the water around the planet's core. To boot, gravity on Neptune is stronger than on Earth and applies more pressure on everything. With such powerful gravity, your dog would be shorter and your cat would be stockier with muscular bodies and thicker skins against the cold. And considering the fluid environment, your pet's best bet is to become like a cosmic whale or manatee floating around the blue planets. Pluto is not very big. It's only half as wide as the United States. Pluto is smaller than Earth's moon. This dwarf planet takes 248 Earth years to go around the sun. If you lived on Pluto, you would have to wait 248 Earth years to celebrate your first birthday. One day on Pluto is about six and a half days on Earth. The farthest planet-like object from the sun is appropriately freezing cold and covered with ice, with weak gravity and a flimsy atmosphere. The sun, from Pluto, is nothing more than a dot on the horizon, much like the moon for Earth, so there's not much going on in terms of light. But scientists suggest that there may be a water ocean under Pluto's surface and some nicer weather. Let's take notes from Earth's creatures with built-in antifreeze, like some insects and fish. Low gravity makes the muscles and bones shrink and the space between vertebrae expand, making your pets taller. Their posture would also change, since their spine, for the most part, would be out of a job. So they'd probably be tall, thin, and somewhat spider-like, with spindly limbs and a curved spine. On other planets beyond the solar system, the boundaries between plants and your pets could be blurred, and your pets might merge with plant life. Your pets might become tree-like, with beating hearts attached to their bodies, or with feet to move to better positions as they compete for light and water. You could also have a rabbit that spends most of its time staying still, photosynthesizing, and only running away if threatened. Or a massive dinosaur-like horse that splays itself out on the ground to get nutrients directly from the soil and obtains extra energy with the help of plants on its back. Cooperation could lead to some fascinating pets, such as a sea of amoeba acting as a single jelly-like mega-creature thousands of voracious shrimp-like carnivores forming a single organism that devours anything in its way, or a web of intertwined trees that collect water in wide pitchers at the top of their canopies. Getting oxygen to muscles is a key for your pet's endurance. Here on Earth, octopuses use a copper-based molecule in their blood to shuttle oxygen, making them more sluggish than mammals and birds that use iron-based hemoglobin. Scientists have speculated about other types of oxygen transport that could make animals fitter. In atmospheres with more oxygen, we might see a pet monkey that can fly without ever having to stop for a rest. On cold planets and moons without much sunlight, such as the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, your pet dog might have to get by with chemical energy rather than take it from the sun. Also, in worlds without light, such as the depths of Enceladus's oceans, there might be little need to evolve eyes. Pets would probably sense their environments using other means, like gills and vibration sensors. You take a giant straw and begin to inflate Saturn. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's enough. Now let's add some giant rings. That's it. This is Super Saturn, also called Saturn on steroids. It's a real object that scientists discovered in 2012, a planet named 
J1407b, and astronomers are still not sure what it really is. It could be a gas giant, like Jupiter or Saturn, in our solar system. Then there would be no solid surface there. And if you wanted to set foot on that planet, you just fall through it, all the way to the core. But it could also be a brown dwarf. That's something between a large planet and a full-fledged star. Such objects have to be heavy enough to start thermonuclear reactions, like those going on inside stars. But the power of these reactions is too weak for brown dwarfs to glow and emit heat. To imagine the size and weight of J1407b, let's look at our Earth. If you put our planet on a scale, it'll show six and another 21 zeros tons. Our planet is also about 7,900 miles across. Now, that's Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Its diameter is 11 times as great as that of Earth. It's also 318 times heavier. If Jupiter were a bucket, you could put 1,321 Earths in it. And this is the hero of the day, Super Saturn. It's almost 20 times as large as Jupiter. To balance the scales, you need to put 6,360 Earths on the other side. The planet's rings are so wide that if they were in the solar system, they would take up more than half the space between the Sun and Earth. And if Super Saturn switched places with the original Saturn, you'd see those rings with the unaided eye. They would be larger than a full moon. Presumably, these rings appeared in the same way as the ones around our Saturn. One theory says they're the remains of a moon that was once there. Its orbit was unstable, and over time, the moon got torn apart by the tidal forces of the huge planet it orbited. Small pieces of the former moon took their places in the giant's orbit. They collided with one another, like in a blender. After some time, everything that was left was basically particles of dust and ice moving around the colossal planet. Another theory suggests that the rings appeared after the moon collided with an asteroid or another moon. Then the gravitational blender did its job and turned the moon's debris into the rings. Some scientists think the rings formed at around the same time as the planet itself. So they're just the remains of the planetary nebula, which is a cloud of gas, space debris, and dust. Later, it probably shrunk and solidified to form a planet. We can only guess where Super Saturn got its rings from, but scientists say their mass is 80% of that of Earth. It may mean that the moon that used to orbit J1407b was about the same size as our planet. There's a little gap in the middle of these rings. Scientists think Super Saturn's moon might be there. If this is the case, it should be about the size of Mars. If scientists are right and Super Saturn is actually a brown dwarf, then this is an incredible discovery. Scientists will be able to watch it age. Supposedly, brown dwarfs lose their energy and shrink fading in the process. And when a brown dwarf exhausts all its energy, it turns into a black dwarf. It's easy to confuse it with a black hole. People haven't discovered black dwarfs anywhere in the universe yet, because they take trillions and quadrillions of years to form. Our universe is too young, and none of the stars, even those that appeared when the universe was born, have had time to become black dwarfs. One of the oldest objects in the universe is the white dwarf, with a pretty long name. WD-0346 plus 246. It's about 11 to 12 billion years old and half as cold as our sun, and it's still cooling. It would need around 10 plus another 15 zeros years to turn into a black dwarf. For comparison, the universe is 1.4 and 10 zeros years old. Scientists believe that a black dwarf will exist for about 10 plus 25 zeros years, feeding on dark matter. After that, its protons, the smallest particles of matter, will begin to decay. And then, the black dwarf will simply evaporate. That will take another 10 plus 49 zeros years. But if the protons remain intact, a much more interesting scenario will await the black dwarf. In another 10 and 1500 zeros years, the black dwarf will become an iron star. It's essentially just a cannonball in space. The Iron Sphere will exist billions of times longer than our entire universe has existed, until it suddenly turns into a black hole. So, the process of the formation of a black dwarf is extremely long. It'd take a regular star an insane amount of time to age that much. But Super Saturn, if it is a brown dwarf, may be much closer to this state. Saturn on steroids is not the only strange planet in our universe. 
This is Blease 436b. It's been detected using the transit method. A transit happens when a planet moves between its host star and an observer. It looks similar to a lunar eclipse. This planet is four times the size of Earth and 22 times as heavy. That's almost like Neptune. It's an exotic water world. The water there is solid, but it's not ice. It has a temperature of about 520 degrees Fahrenheit. The water in your pot turns into steam at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But on Gliese 436b, the liquid remains solid because of the extreme pressure on the planet. Scientists have also discovered that the planet's atmosphere is evaporating into outer space. That's why there's a giant circular cloud around it. It's constantly moving in its orbit, giving the planet a long tail that looks like that of a comet. Cancri E holds incredible riches worth more than all the money on Earth. There are diamonds scattered all over the planet. Cancri E is about twice as wide and eight times as heavy as Earth. This planet doesn't rotate. Only one of its sides always faces its host star. The surface temperature there is almost twice as high as the temperature of a burning fire. And since the host star is rich in carbon, the planet contains plenty of this element too. The intense pressure and temperatures help turn carbon into graphite and diamonds. Unfortunately, this planet is 40 light years away from our home. So it'd take about 730,000 years to get there on a regular rocket. Another planet rich in gems is Hat P7b. It's about 1,000 light years away from Earth. It's 60% as large and nearly twice as heavy as Jupiter. The planet is so close to its host star that it makes one revolution around it in just two Earth days. Because of such close proximity to the star, Hat P7b is almost as hot as a white dwarf. If you look at the night side of this planet, you'll see unusual clouds. Scientists believe that these clouds may be rich in corundum material. This is the very substance that forms rubies and sapphires, so it's likely to rain very expensive and beautiful gems there. Wasp 12b is one of the darkest planets ever discovered. Only one of its sides faces its host star. The planet's surface is so dark that it eats up about 94% of all visible light, so it looks a lot like a black hole. The host star heats up the planet so much that the material there continuously evaporates. Then the star's strong gravity pulls this cloud toward itself, forming a disk. But TRES-2b is the champion. It's the darkest planet known to people. It absorbs 99% of the light coming from its star, which means it consumes more light than a piece of coal. 1% of the remaining light looks red as it gets reflected by this gas giant. From afar, this planet looks very evil. One of the oldest planets in the universe is PSR B1620 26b. It's about 12.7 billion years old. This means that it formed about 1 billion years after the Big Bang. The planet is so old that its two host stars have had time to evolve. One is a white dwarf. The other is a pulsar that makes almost 100 revolutions per second. Sunrises on this planet must be stunning. Right now, this star system is moving toward a dense cluster of stars. This is likely to lead to a stellar collision, so the fate of this planet is unknown. Kepler 438b is one of the most Earth-like planets. It's only 12% larger and is in the habitable zone of its host star, not too close and not too far away. It's a sweet spot where water doesn't evaporate because of the heat and doesn't turn into ice because of the cold. This planet might host life on its surface. In the future, it may also become a new home for humanity, but it would take people about 470 years to get to this planet even if we traveled at the speed of light, which is impossible due to the laws of physics. If you landed on Mercury, the first thing you'd notice would be how close it is to the Sun. It's actually the closest planet to the big ball of fire and the smallest, but it's not the hottest planet. Venus takes credit for that. It takes Earth 365 days to orbit the Sun, and it takes Mercury more than three months. Well, 88 days to be exact. The days are boiling hot, with a temperature reaching above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the other side of the planet that the Sun doesn't reach, the temperatures drop to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's atmosphere can't hold any heat when it's nighttime, just like a desert. 
Deserts have no atmosphere, which is why they have no moisture and no clouds or rain. If you manage to get from one end of the planet to the other and always stay in between the scorching heat and freezing cold, then you can survive. But oxygen isn't a friend to Mercury's atmosphere, so you just live for as long as you could hold your breath. Plus, there's a magnetic field that has solar winds from the sun that create plasma tornadoes. Venus can heat up to almost 1,000 degrees, but gravity is really similar to that of Earth. You can go for walks by the mountains and even go jogging, but the temperature will instantly melt you, so maybe forget about those jogging sessions. The extreme pressure would also crush you like a can. It's like being half a mile underwater on Earth. So, you'd only last a few seconds on Venus. The red planet is home to the highest mountain in the solar system, around three times taller than Mount Everest. And it's also a volcano. Despite being called the red planet, Mars is actually really cold. It needs a little less than two years to rotate around the sun, or 687 days to be precise. And almost like Earth, it has 25 hours in a day. The atmosphere over there is very thin, but unbreathable. The planet has loads of dust storms that cover the entire planet, and polar caps that are covered with carbon dioxide. You won't freeze in your spot, but you'd need some thick clothing to keep warm. It's possible to last as long as you can hold your breath. On the bright side, though, you'd get to see some incredible views. The solar system's biggest planet is the mighty Jupiter. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then Earth would just be the size of a single grape compared to it. It only needs 10 hours to rotate around its axis, which is a lot shorter than Earth's. One of the best tourist attractions is the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that's lasted more than 300 years. Oh, and the area is about twice the size of Earth. The largest planet in our solar system needs around 12 Earth years, or 4,307 days, to make a complete circle around the Sun. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than Earth's. Besides the lack of oxygen and winds that can keep you suspended in the air forever, the immense pressure would crush you. Visiting here won't last longer than a few seconds. Pluto is a former planet furthest from the Sun in our solar system, and is now considered to be a dwarf planet. And because it's that far, it's one of the coldest places ever, with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely bring a jacket. Or two. Methane ice covers the mountains that soar at over 10,000 feet. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the sun. It's technically still in rotation, waiting to celebrate New Year's. But it just needs six Earth days to complete a rotation around itself. And, surprise, surprise, the air is also unbreathable. Besides the methane floating around, nitrogen is also pretty common. The gravity is weak, so you'd have to hold your breath while floating in the air before freezing like an ice cube. Again, you'd only last a couple of seconds. The windiest planet in our solar system is Neptune. The core is similar to that of Earth. It has 14 moons surrounding it. A day is kind of short compared to Earth. You'd have only 17 hours in a single day. And similar to Pluto, it needs more than 150 years to spin around the Sun. Neptune is also known as the Blue Planet because of the absorption of the red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. So besides not breathing, the pressure can also crush you, just like on Jupiter. No one can last more than a few seconds there. The second biggest planet is none other than Saturn, with rings surrounding it. From far away, its rings look like one big chunk of rock spinning around. But in fact, it's made up of many layers of ice particles and rocks, ranging in all sizes, from tiny pebbles to bus-sized objects. The rings are shaped in such a way because of the gravity around Saturn. A day on Saturn lasts only 11 hours. It's very windy in the upper atmosphere. Saturn also has plenty of moons like Jupiter. And, just like on Jupiter, you'd be crushed by extreme pressure deep in the planet before you can open your eyes. You wouldn't last longer than a few seconds here, either. Titan is Saturn's largest moon and second largest moon in the solar system. It has the closest Earth-like conditions compared to any existing planet or moon, so living here should be a walk in the park. But the cold weather will freeze you. This moon is actually the only place in the whole solar system that has liquid rivers, oceans, and lakes. They're all covered with methane and ethane, and the atmosphere is very similar to that of Earth. It even rains here at certain times. 
Our moon isn't so friendly either. Because of the lack of oxygen, you can just last as long as you can hold your breath. The cosmic rays from the sun will also affect you, but skipping along the moon craters is actually quite fun. If you tried going to the sun, you'd vaporize in the blink of an eye. The temperatures can reach around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just an estimated measurement near the core. There are still the outer layers you need to worry about that'll also leave you in atoms. Your best bet is to hit the brakes and take the nearest exit. Estimated time on the sun? Less than a second. Our little blue planet is the only place we can live in where an average human can reach 80 years old. We adapted to many weather conditions that aren't crazy, with the gravity just about right so we don't feel crushed. We can live anywhere from dry deserts to snowy ice peaks. It's the only place that has the perfect balance for us to survive. Scientists hope that one day we can live on planets other than our own. Mars is the closest place that can host us, considering we'd have to build a dome in order to live there. Elon Musk wants to use Tesla bots as the first non-human crew to land there and start building our future homes. The robots can acquire information about the planet and mimic the way humans walk and behave, so it'll let us see what we'll need to worry about. In all cases, humans will need to be suited up in order to come close to any planet. Our bodies aren't designed to face such conditions unless we evolve naturally to fit the environment. The tardigrade is the only animal on Earth that can live in the most extreme conditions, from the deepest oceans to the highest mountain peaks. They shot some of these microscopic critters into space and found out that they can live in the vacuum of space for up to 10 days and return without breaking a sweat. They're probably the only known creatures on Earth that can live the longest on any planet except the sun. Scientists claim that if a large asteroid hits the Earth, then tardigrades can perfectly survive. But humans are simply not designed to live outside of Earth without the proper gear. Bang! Another hit on Jupiter. Hmm, let's see. Gas giant, the largest planet in the solar system, 318 times bigger than the Earth, two and a half times bigger than the rest of the planets in the solar system put together. One more interesting thing. If it got any bigger, it would actually become smaller. You see, with more mass, the planet would be denser. That would cause Jupiter to start pulling in on itself. Scientists say Jupiter could have four times greater mass, but still keep the same size. It takes 10 hours to make a full rotation on its axis. It's the fastest spinning planet in our solar system and gets hit by so many space objects all the time. This was discovered by amateur astronomers observing Jupiter and saw some unusual flash at the planet's surface. Impact events cause flashes like that, and for some reason, Jupiter gets more impacts than other planets. In 1994, astronomers discovered Shoemaker-Levy 9, a comet that broke apart and collided with the gas giant. The original comet was approximately the size of one that erased the dinosaurs. However, this asteroid fell apart into more than 20 fragments. They darkened the planet's surface, and it remained like that for months. Fifteen years later, in 2009, astronomers saw a black spot on Jupiter the size of Earth. It was the result of an asteroid around 650 to 1,650 feet in length. The biggest asteroid recorded on Earth hit the area of Tunguska, Russia in 1908. This caused a massive explosion, even though no one ever found a crater. So why is Jupiter the target for so many space objects? Asteroids and comets that pass by Earth and Jupiter go almost at the same speed. The number density of the space object that may interact is almost the same too. But the cross-section of what they might hit is very different. Jupiter has 11 times the diameter of our planet, which means it has around 125 times the cross-section. The more massive some planet is, the stronger its gravitational attraction. So it will entice some space objects drifting by. Our gravitational field is weaker than Jupiter's. If some object passes near us moving at a speed of 22,300 miles per hour or less, our gravitation will attract it. Asteroids and comets usually move at bigger speeds. Jupiter attracts most of the comets and asteroids passing by. If our planet was hit by such big objects as frequently as Jupiter, we'd have extinction like with dinosaurs thousands of times more often. In 2020, scientists found there was an unusual asteroid in the orbit of Venus, the first one there. The size of a small mountain and rich in minerals we can find in Earth's deep rocks. They even think it could be a clue to a bigger set of asteroids created when our solar system was forming. That's not the only mystery around Venus. 
The planet has insanely violent winds that drive clouds and storms around the planet at speeds greater than 220 miles per hour. That's 60 times faster than Venus itself rotates. Also, scientists are still not sure what happened with its oceans. They believe since the planet is so close to the sun, the water evaporated and went into the atmosphere as steam. It trapped heat coming from the sun, heat that would have vaporized more and more water over time. Venus probably had an environment like on Earth, but a very long time ago. The theory says many comets and asteroids were slamming into Venus. Billions of the planet's pieces were flying all around. Some may have even crashed into Earth's moon. Pieces that slammed into our planet are probably buried very deep, since we have greater geological activity than the moon. Uranus also had a collision, but a more serious one than asteroids. The rest of the planets in our solar system mostly have an axis of rotation that kind of points up from the elliptical plane. Uranus is tilted, lying on the side. So a season there lasts 42 years, when either its south or the north pole is pointed at the sun. Most of the planets also rotate counterclockwise when you see them from above our solar system. Venus does the opposite, which means maybe it was kicked off axis a long time ago. Uranus may have collided with the other space body millions of years ago. When our solar system was still very young, the orbital configuration of Saturn and Jupiter may have crossed. Their gravitational forces kind of created orbital momentum and transferred it to Uranus. That knocked it off axis. Millions of asteroids orbit the Sun, and not so many pass by Earth from time to time. So we don't have some dangerous space bodies coming toward us. The plan is to visit Mars in the 2030s. And scientists hope Mars won't be a target of some bigger space bodies. New craters are formed on the red planet every one to two days. They can be 13 feet across, which means they could have been formed by objects that are the size of a soccer ball. Since the atmosphere there is thinner than ours, smaller bodies can enter easier. Most of the Martian north is smooth lowlands. The south is higher, full of craters, and the planet's interior has a surprising amount of rare metals. The theory says this is because a big celestial body collided with Mars and tore away a part of its northern half. Debris from that asteroid circled the planet and then mixed into two small moons that orbit Mars. We also have some Mars rocks on Earth, found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and some other places across the globe. Some of these rocks have gas that's chemically the same as the atmosphere on Mars. Rocks probably came due to a big explosion that happened when some larger asteroid or meteor that was ejected from Mars and landed on our planet. Mercury also has a thin atmosphere, so there are many smaller strikes there. Imagine waking up, going to your window, and see there are micrometeor showers every morning, which is something that happens on Mercury. This strange weather pattern shapes its atmosphere, called an exosphere. Mercury is so dense, its heavy iron core accounts for two-thirds of its total mass. Scientists think it could have been bigger in the past, but many collisions got the surface sort of scraped off. It's been constantly bombarded by rocks from space that left marks with craters. Planes on its surface seem to have been created because of volcanic lava spilling over the surface and then dried smooth. Many craters are filled with such a material, which means there's one more thing that rocked Mercury's world – volcanoes. There's an unusual group of asteroids discovered near Neptune. Wide range in sizes, from big metropolitan areas to tiny pebbles. They are thought to come from an asteroid group called the Kuiper Belt. It makes a ring well beyond Neptune. But these new asteroids have different colors than the Kuiper Belt. They're so far away from the Sun, their surface was supposed to stay almost pristine but they have a similar color to those sun-baked asteroids around Jupiter. Like the rest of the planets, Neptune gets heat from the sun. But there's something mysterious inside the planet that makes it generate more heat than it gets. This affects its weather, and Neptune has the weirdest weather in the whole solar system. Massive storms, insanely high winds, cirrus-like clouds that rapidly change all the time. There are dark spots in its atmosphere. They come and go. We receive a thousand times more sunlight than Neptune. Gas giants like Saturn and Jupiter can protect our planet from asteroids. Without them, the big impacts that created enough debris to form both moons and other planets would happen more often. There's a huge asteroid going around Saturn, which could be a potential flyby by 2031, more than 10 times bigger than the asteroid that erased the dinosaurs. 
Titan, one of the moons orbiting Saturn, 80% more massive than our moon, is actually the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. It's one and a half times thicker than ours and consists mainly of nitrogen, like our atmosphere. No one knows where all that nitrogen came from. However, unlike Saturn and most of the other places in our solar system, its moon has a real potential to host life. Get your closet ready. We're moving to Mercury. Your mission is to find out what you need to wear there to feel comfortable. So, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun in our solar system. It's pretty hot here, about 800 degrees Fahrenheit, twice as much as your kitchen oven can produce. You need a heat reflective suit like this. It looks like foil for duck roasting. The shiny, almost mirror-like surface reflects the heat rays and keeps everything inside from getting baked. That's you. This suit is designed to get to the hearts of volcanoes on Earth and can withstand up to 1,470 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as much as at the equator of Mercury. Oh, and bring an oxygen tank. Otherwise, you won't be able to breathe there. And you need to strap some heavy dumbbells to your legs. Mercury is smaller than Earth, and gravity is almost three times weaker here. So you have to increase your weight almost three times to feel comfortable. It gets extremely cold there at night, so you need to stuff your thermal suit with insulation. But even that won't save you from the cold. It's three times colder than at the North Pole. Plus, Mercury's atmosphere doesn't protect you from solar radiation as well as Earth's. So, you need to wear thick lead plates under your suit for protection. But the best thing to do is just evacuate from this planet. The next one is Venus. Although it's called Earth's twin sister, the scenery here looks frightening. A hot desert with volcanoes and clouds so dense that you can barely see the sun. These clouds contribute to the greenhouse effect. So, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system, 890 degrees Fahrenheit. But the usual heat reflective suit won't help you this time. The atmospheric pressure here is 92 times higher than on the surface of the Earth. That's like diving 3,200 feet underwater so the air on Venus will just crush you. To survive, you need an airtight suit made of titanium or other sturdy materials. On Earth, we use an atmospheric diving suit like this to withstand the intense pressure underwater. It's like a mini submarine in the shape of a human body, and it's already equipped with an oxygen tank. Yes, the air on Venus is not only unbreathable, it's also toxic. The next planet is Earth. Just look out the window and decide for yourself what to wear today, okay? Let's go to Earth's satellite, the Moon. A few people have been here already, and they were wearing pretty big spacesuits. The main thing is to bring an oxygen tank. It's contained in a backpack along with the life support system. Even though it's cold, there's no atmosphere, it's almost a vacuum, and there's no air particles to take heat from your body, so you won't freeze instantly. Your suit itself should be airtight and keep the atmospheric pressure inside. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature the fluid can boil over. In space, fluids from your body can evaporate in seconds. You don't want that, so you should wear a spacesuit. It'll also save you from dangerous solar radiation. The moon is defenseless against it. And the gravity here is six times weaker than on Earth. So you can jump six times higher and lift six times more weight. It makes sense to take a little weight with you, so you don't feel as clumsy as the first astronauts. Next up, Mars. In summer, you could walk around here in shorts and a t-shirt. The highest recorded temperature here is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. In colder times, you'd have to wear a sweater and a warm jacket here, maybe even two. The average temperature here is slightly colder than the coldest point on Earth. But the atmospheric pressure here is frustrating. It's 170 times less than we're used to. Take the altitude at which commercial airplanes fly on Earth. Multiply it by three. The conditions there are very similar to those on Mars. It's cold and there's no oxygen to breathe. Without a spacesuit, you'd last two minutes at most on Mars. So you need an airtight spacesuit on you all the time on the surface of Mars. NASA scientists are preparing a new generation of spacesuits that will allow astronauts to climb, crawl, and bend without difficulty. You'd feel like a real athlete on the surface of Mars. The gravity there is three times weaker than on Earth. 
so you could easily lift an animal the size of a tiger there. Don't forget to put a spacesuit on it, of course. Now, let's fly through the asteroid belt further into space and arrive at Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it's a gas giant. That means there's no solid surface, so you can't even stand there. Although, hypothetically, you could jump into Jupiter. Then you'd keep falling all the way to the planet's core. Suppose you're standing on a platform just above the surface of the planet. The first thing you feel is the force of gravity. It's 2.5 times stronger here. You feel it pulling you down, and you can barely even jump up. So it would be nice to equip your spacesuit with an exoskeleton to support your body and help you move. Plus, it's incredibly cold. You'll feel the cold at about negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of the clouds of the gas giant. And what makes things worse is the constant wind. It can reach speeds of up to 900 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the speed of commercial airplanes on Earth. That kind of cold wind will instantly draw heat away from your body, so your spacesuit must be really thick and warm. But the pressure at the top of these clouds is almost the same as on Earth. Technically, you could even take off your helmet here if it weren't for the lack of oxygen and severe cold. Maybe Saturn promises better conditions. Another gas giant. The gravitational force here is almost the same as on Earth, so nothing will constrain your movements, except for a massive spacesuit. It's even colder here than on Jupiter, and the pressure here is about the same as about 15 feet underwater on Earth. So, the spacesuit not only lets you breathe and stay warm, but keeps your eardrums intact. Hey, hold on tight! You just almost got blown away by a gust of wind over 1,100 miles per hour. That's not unusual on Saturn. That kind of wind on Earth could get you from one coast of the United States to another in just two and a half hours. The only option to warm up here is to jump down to the center of the planet. The closer you get to the core, the warmer it gets. But the pressure rises at a tremendous rate. In just a few seconds of freefall, even the toughest titanium suit will be crushed. Let's finally step onto a solid surface, Titan, Saturn's moon. It's 1.5 times the size of our moon and 80% heavier. And its surface is mostly composed of water, ice, and rock. The pressure here is a little bit higher than on Earth. You wouldn't feel any discomfort if it weren't extremely cold. Titan is 9.5 times further from the Sun than Earth, so our star can barely warm this moon. The air here is mostly nitrogen, just like on Earth. But oxygen is completely absent here, so it's impossible to breathe without a spacesuit. There may be a huge ocean beneath Titan's surface. Saturn's gravity heats up this moon's core enough to make the ice melt. Plus, it must be extremely salty, which means it can remain liquid even at very low temperatures. The next two planets are Uranus and Neptune. So Uranus holds the record for the coldest planet in our solar system. The temperature here is about negative 224 degrees Celsius, so bring the warmest spacesuit you have. They say if you jump to the center of Uranus, at one point the pressure becomes so high that it turns hydrogen into a crust of ice. And if you get even lower, you can see the rocky core. Neptune, in turn, holds the record for the strongest winds in the solar system. It's an ice giant, just like Uranus. So the dress code here is the usual. A super warm spacesuit, a tank of oxygen, and a heating system. So far, we don't have the kind of spacesuit that would help you survive on any of the gas giants. But if you get to the core of Neptune, it gets too hot. Its temperature is almost the same as on the surface of the Sun. TRES-2b is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here, it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES-2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter. And its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 
55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. HD 189377b oh, I'm not going to say that again is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well, for comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70 is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler 70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours. And those clouds I mentioned are not made of water, but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, 
which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. We're used to thinking that asteroids are the only free-floating rocks in space, but things like OTS-44 make you think twice and shiver. Imagine a planet about 11 times more massive than Jupiter roaming in space without being bound to the orbit of any star. Given its gargantuan size and mass, if OTS-44 collides with any other planet, it would utterly destroy it and go on floating as if nothing happened. Scarier still, scientists are sure there are millions of such rogue planets out there just waiting to be discovered. There's no hard proof of their existence yet, but theoretically, carbon planets have formed somewhere closer to the center of our galaxy. Any oxygen getting in their atmosphere will get into a reaction with carbon and transform into CO2, forming black, toxic clouds. On the ground, there would be oceans made of tar, spewing up geysers of methane and crude oil. There would be rains, too, but they'd be far from refreshing. Torrents of pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt would blast the ground and probably burst into flames on impact. Hard to imagine anything that would survive such conditions. An hour after people disappear, most urban areas will be left empty and quiet. Perhaps the sound of wind, falling leaves, or other natural sounds previously drowned out by city noise and traffic will be heard. The subways of many cities are protected from groundwater by a system of pumps. If there are no people to monitor such systems, most subways will flood within 36 hours. Due to malfunctions, sewage treatment plants will stop working, leading to pollution of rivers and lakes with wastewater. The water pipes in Detroit will become unusable, leading to the flooding of the city. Food in refrigerators will spoil. Raccoons and wolves will inhabit abandoned human homes. Major airports will be covered in rust and overgrown with ivy. Cruise ships in Alaska will sink under the weight of ice that accumulates on them. Lions from the San Diego Zoo will gradually escape, emboldened by the power outage of the electric fence around their enclosures. More and more black cats will appear on the streets of Rome and the Vatican. Rats and mice will consume all edible reserves and leave the cities. Plants will begin to grow in cracks in streets, highways, sidewalks, and buildings. 
more and more animals will notice the absence of people and flock to the cities. International Space Station will gradually decrease. Since no one will correct its orbit, the station will eventually fall to Earth and burn up. Along with it, digitized samples of human DNA will perish. A large part of the city's territory will be covered with a vegetation of lianas, grasses, and tree seedlings. The red square in Moscow will have a layer of soil and thick grasses growing, making the square completely green. Despite high levels of radiation, animal populations are increasing in abandoned areas. Plants have grown in many houses and buildings. Seawater will flood cities that were once drained by artificial drainage systems, such as London and Amsterdam. Satellites will begin to fall to Earth. Since no one maintained their speed of movement, they slowly approached Earth and eventually fell to the planet's surface. Wolves now roam freely around the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, and wild boars will be seen in Paris. Human speech will be preserved in rare words that parrots have memorized during their years of living with humans. Snakes will not only reproduce at incredible rates, but also grow much larger in size. Their main prey will be rodents that have multiplied in the first years after humans disappeared. Many human-made structures will collapse within 100 years, primarily those with a large number of steel elements. Fruit Christmas cakes, thanks to their alcohol coating, will not only retain their appearance but also freshness. Most buildings will be overtaken by plants and animals, and the city will resemble more of a wild nature landscape. The period of nuclear fuel decay will come to an end, and as a result, dead zones around the ruins of nuclear power plants will once again become habitable. The last parrots that spoke human language may go extinct since they memorized human speech, but it is simply not necessary for their survival in the wild. All modern carriers of information that preserve human culture, laser discs, photographic film, paper and the like, will turn to dust. Rebar inside concrete buildings, which are more durable than steel ones, will expand three times due to rust, causing the destruction of concrete structures. Most modern cities will be covered by a green blanket, and collapsed skyscrapers and buildings will become new hills. Manhattan will return to its former state before human settlement, with numerous streams and lakes. There will be almost no evidence of the existence of human civilization. Only powerful stone buildings that rely solely on the force of gravity will survive, such as Notre Dame de Paris. Of the products that existed during human civilization, only honey, especially in clay pots, and oil in wooden barrels, will be well preserved. Only a few stone structures will survive, including the pyramids in Giza and the Sphinx, almost entirely buried in the sands of the desert and fragments of the Great Wall of China. By this time, a new ice age will begin on Earth. It is expected that the KEO satellite will enter the atmosphere by this time. Various pieces of space debris will collide with it during its descent, but this will not destroy the satellite. Eventually, it will fall into the waters of the world ocean. Remnants of spacecraft and satellite debris will float through space as the only reminder of human civilization.